Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. This is a podcast for owners of bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses. And I'm your host, Roger Connect. For more than 20 years, I've been working with accounting professionals to help them start and build the Premier Accounting Firms in their areas, offering quality accounting services and getting paid what they're worth. Whether you're a solopreneur or you're working with a staff, a team of individuals, this is a podcast dedicated to helping you address things ranging from marketing to selling, pricing, client onboarding, tech stacks, mental health, and so much more. Each and every week, we bring on the experts to actually share with you insights that you need to consider as you're running your business. Today's going to be no exception. We actually have Omri Mann. He is someone that I've recently met and gotten to know a little bit. He is the CRO and founder of Anchor. With 15 years of hands-on experience in digital marketing and business development, he is a skilled software entrepreneur and an active investor in the tech space. Over the last four years, Omri has actually been on a mission to revolutionize business using automation, creating an Amazon-like experience for both accountants and their clients from proposal to payment. Before joining Anchor, Omri successfully founded three companies, NTT, a website creation platform, Zebra Media, a software distribution network, and Winja, a growth hacking consultancy firm for the software SaaS space. His passion for empowering businesses and dedication to innovative solutions keeps him up at night together with his newborn son. So we're obviously happy to have him here. He's always thinking about the accounting community now with the intent to eliminate burnout and make things such as late payments, friction, and cl- uh, friction with clients, and manual work a thing of the past. So Omri, welcome to the show. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is going to be a, a great experience. Uh, I've been interacting a little bit with Anchor lately, meeting a number of your colleagues, but I'd like to get to the backstory, learn a little bit about you, your background. Obviously, as a serial entrepreneur with the di- different things in in business, I ki- I want to understand what brought you to the accounting space. What was this pain point that you were experiencing that caused you to realize maybe there's something here that you could actually influence or affect? Uh, so it's a great question. So I don't think like anyone you know, wakes up in the morning and say, wow, I want to automate invoicing and prevent late payments. Like, <laughs> so that, that's never the case. Uh, it, I, I've been an entrepreneur since I can remember myself. Uh, even in the age of six, I would open, I would take some of my toys and try to sell it to my sister. And then regulation would kill that business very quickly. Uh, <laughs> but that entrepreneurial bug was always there. And I had software companies. I had uh you know consultancy you know a consultancy firm and, and a very diverse even medical device firm that we IPO'd in London and it was all these experiences had one thing in common the markets were different the you know the target audience were different but one thing that was consistent was my you know dislike of billing and chasing payments doesn't matter what kind of impact I would drive, you know, in the business towards my clients, I would still end up on these weird, annoying phone calls of, oh, oh, you're you're on a ski vacation. Uh, sure, sure. I'll, I'll send the invoice again. Uh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> it's OK. And and I. I and it really made me hate billing. And sometimes, you know, I loved my clients, but in those days, I really didn't. So it, it caused me to question this and look at it and say, is this really a necessity? Is this broken reality something that needs to, you know, be the norm? And right now, sadly, people are treating it as the norm. They sort of as a, a chronic pain. So I had the good fortune of meeting Rome Lackritz, who's the CEO of the company, that shared the same pain. Uh, he opened four different startups uh, and sold a few and had the privilege to see how payments are done from, you know, a very, very small business all the way to like mega enterprise and saw that, you know, the AR process is completely broken. Getting paid is broken. The costs of it is is it's enormous to the business. And that led us on a journey to try and figure out how we solve it. And, you know, and, but I, I don't want to over talk. So I think. 
No, no, no. You're, you're doing good. So one of the things that impresses me is there's people that run into issues, find problems, and they look for a solution. Other people are the types that they will actually run into a problem, realize there's a need for something, and they'll create the solution. Obviously, with these businesses that you've already started and this working with Rome, you're in a position where you're more in that mindset of let's find well, now let's create, let's solve this situation. I'm just kind of curious, Anchor, uh, what's what's the backstory behind it? You you kind of gave the analogy of the, the person on the ski slope, you're calling them to say, hey, you've missed a payment and having that awkward conversation. But that's entirely different than creating a process and offering a service to resolve that situation. So um, why did you all of the three businesses that you're already involved in get involved with this new one? So on a personal level, uh, I was in a place in my life that I was, I, I think, very privileged. I have already sold a few companies where, you know, relatively you know, financially successful or had my freedom and felt that I am old, like literally, you know, that, that I have retired uh, and gave up on, on being active in life too soon. And meaning I, I was doing consultancy and investing in startups and, you know, living the easy life. And I understood that, you know, I need to be in the trenches. I want to do something, create something and make something that is impactful. And meeting room was, you know, just uh, we, you know, our paths just cross each other. He was, you know, uh, one of the startups that I invested in took him as an external CFO to lead the IPO. And we really clicked. He's an amazing person. And he, you know, and we sort of bonded and he had that idea to do this. And I, you know, naturally, you know, it resonated with me quite well because I had the same pain point. And he said, okay, let's have, you know, two meetings around, you know, marketing and stuff. I want to get your two cents. Two meetings became 10. And here I am talking to you as a founder after four years. But so I think it was an opportunity that really just on a personal level really uh, found me in a right place in life. And apart from that, I think this is one of the first ventures that I did that I mostly care around the path and not the end result. The end result will be amazing. The company will grow. It's going to be succeed, successful. But in most cases, uh, what was interesting for me is only like the bottom line. The result is, you know, the money maybe. Uh, maybe it's because, you know, when I grow up, most of the arguments with my parents was were always around money. So at a very early stage in my life, I decided like money's not going to be an issue. And I was very, very driven. And that was a very good fuel for me. And, you know, it led me to a certain point. But then after you succeed a little bit, you know, you know, you, the momentum keeps going, but I would land deals. And I, then I would say, like, oh, God, now I need to do it. And then I understood something's broken and I need to, like, understand what I need to update and rediscover a new fuel. And, you know, redefining basically what success means to me. And I think that was an accumulation of all these things led me to say, okay, I'm going into a startup where it's a, a very long journey. And to succeed in that, you basically need to become almost a different person in terms of your strengths, your ability to leverage what you're good at and really like, you know, find really smart people that will do the stuff you suck at. And at the end of that journey, uh, whether you're successful or not, you're going to be a much stronger, different person. And that was the, you know, internal reasoning for why I, you know, that went into the startup. But, you know, and the inner motion is always helping people, is trying to, you know, it's, uh, I don't know if it's an ego trip, I assume, or hope not. But it's, for me, it's the most satisfying thing to see someone that I know exactly what they're experiencing, or I see that they're wearing blindfolds, and I can actually help them and say, like, look, you know, I, I can help, like, I've been there, like, look here, it's, it's different. Uh, so that's super exciting for us and every client that we're able to, you know, touch and, and make a real impact, a measurable impact in their business and most, mostly in their lives, I think, because most of our community are not huge businesses. There are businesses that are being 
piloted by an owner that maybe grew and have, you know, like right now, you know, 10, 20, 50 employees, but it's still, they are the business. They are the heart of the business still. So when you're impacting that, you're directly impacting their lives. And, you know, for us, that's, you know, have goosebumps when I'm talking to you about it. But that's, I think that's the fuel. Yeah, no, I, I want to back up a little bit because you've really touched on a number of things that really interest me. I'm going to back up to your exits and really talk about that experience of building a company multiple times, having these phenomenal exits, and then uh, basically coming out of early retirement. So we're going to get into these two things. So with your exits, from an accounting perspective, we're obviously working with clients, helping them run their companies. And it's always a privilege to be able to get to a point where the client is exiting and we can help with that experience of transitioning a business to a new owner, giving the valuation. That's something to be you know experienced by everyone. But your point of view how was the accounting helpful or influential in each of those exits? So yeah, I look at it from, you know, my own personal relationship with my accountant, maybe. That's the best way to view it. Okay. It, I, I'm not a CPA. Uh, Rome, my partner, is a CPA. He's like the, ma- you know, he's the CFO in the company. He's very masterful with these things. And I was always more the people's person, the, you know, the person that navigates the business puzzle of things. So having that, you know, on my side when, you know, you need to really grind into the numbers and understand fully, you know, how you sell it, what are the processes and have someone on my corner to facilitate that with me was priceless. So for me, it was something that is beyond, okay, just, you know, marking the numbers. It was someone that was with me in the journey. And, you know, maybe this, you know, we can touch about that later, but the value that was provided to me at that stage is something that I feel can be leveraged into the pricing models that we're currently using in the space. Uh, so by the, back then, he actually had an hourly pricing and I think, you know, for him, that was wrong. I would pay a lot more because <laughs> he provided like unbelievable, you know, wealth of, of experience that was worth so much more for me. I think everybody that's listening would have appreciated that little insight right there of the hourly billing wasn't something that was conducive to their experience and background and how they were contributing to that business valuation. And clearly, you just said you would have paid a lot more. And I think that's really important to to have everyone kind of hear. But let's go to the accounting itself and how it impacted the valuation Mm -hmm. of your business to give you the exit that you got. Was it was it very helpful when you went to that potential buyer with the books in place to be able to say, here's the accounting, and in each of those instances, use that as a plus rather than a negative in its valuation? So that that's very interesting, and I can tap into even experiences that, you know, we had companies that I wasn't the owner, but more an advisor and saw the differences between having, you know, proper books and everything in place and going and getting to that point of selling. So in two of the companies, I did a poor job. Like the, the plan was not to exit the company. So I didn't use like in, in the tech space, basically, for anyone to consider, you know, an audited books or something that they can actually trust, you need to use, you know, one of the big threes. Like anyone local, like in, 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 in my space, in the tech space specifically, it doesn't count. So if you're, you know, starting up uh, a tech firm, so you want the, you know, day-to-day stuff to be with someone that you trust that's local, but always have it audited by, you know, a big company and... Because reverse engineering the books so that they actually audit, you know, like years of work and getting back to you takes a long time. Even if you're organized, it can take up to, you know, six months. And six months, if you're trying to sell a business, can, you know, uh, time kills all deals. So if, if, you know, that could be the make or break to, you know, a potential exit. Uh, so in that regards, in two sales were... It didn't flunk, but it, it. I had a ton of homework to do. I, I wasn't uh, like the books were not in good shape in terms of being organized and 
the one company was the owner of other companies and there was not, you know, there was a few uh, geolocations as well. So, and each had their own. So it was a, it was a lot of fun and there was a lot of creativity in terms of, you know, the tax structure, everything legal, but a lot of creativity because you're able to, in Israel at least, where, you know, the R&D center was stationed, you're able to create uh, different tax structures. So, for instance, you have developers in Cyprus where there's, you know, uh, very little tax relative and you can... so. It has a lot. It had a lot of moving parts. Uh, so, if I had thought about it in advance, I could have shaved a lot of time. So, what I'm hearing you say is, when the books were kind of convoluted, disorganized, not not uh, really clear, it detracted from the valuation because it didn't give a good picture of what the company was worth. But when they were organized, they were thorough, they were current, and there was a good deal of history. It gave more confidence to the numbers being used to essentially determine a valuation of the business. Naturally, it builds confidence when, when the books are in order. Uh, for me, luckily, it didn't influence the, the actual number at the end of the sale because there was a lot of trust and there was uh, prior acquaintance with the people that I sold the business to. So it wasn't like, okay, someone found me uh -huh. online. So there was a lot of trust and they knew that it was a process. They knew the business from before. They were even clients at some point. So they had a very, very deep and personal understanding of what I'm doing. Uh, but that's mostly not the case in most of the businesses or, you know, M&As that I've encountered. Like these, I had... A part of what I did, I, I did uh, cross-border M and A's uh, with Chinese companies. It's a different, maybe a different topic. We can talk about it for now. But there was a stage in 2016 where um, Chinese public companies would look into the West and try to buy Western companies for roughly around 10x EBITDA. And these companies oh are normally they would be companies that generate relatively a lot of cash flow, but in a normal investment eyes will never be sold for, you know, more than four times EBITDA. The logic to that was that in China at the time, it was sort of a bubble because you had a train company that would have, uh, you know, a 60 multiplier on EBITDA. So they would buy something in 10, swallow the numbers into their books and immediately made, you know, X60 on EBITDA. And over a trillion dollars left China in that format. And the tech scene specifically, the advertising space that is maybe it has a lot of cash flow and, and normally the margins are high. That was a very, very interesting niche for them. And I, you know, was part of that industry. So I was able to participate in that. It was a very interesting experience. Uh, having said that, most companies had lousy books. And it kept them from being able to sell it because it was very, very fast moving. And if you didn't have it and it was like, OK, let's you know get back to you in six months, that's basically killed yeah. all those deals. Amazing. No, that's an excellent insight. I appreciate you sharing that. I wasn't familiar with the 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 business philosophy of that until you shared it. And uh, it makes complete sense. I can see why you would absorb that's that. That's no longer the case. The regulation in China has killed this massively so right now if you want to sell a company into china it's it's a, a horrible thing <laughs> it's very hard wow no that's fascinating okay uh, there was one more thing that i wanted to ask before moving on further and it was regarding your exit and then after a period of time re-entering the business world uh basically you came out of early retirement i, I presume you were in your 20s 30s no, i was in my late 30s uh late 30s with, okay I, I never considered it a, a a retirement. I was fooling myself that I'm working. I would spend hours in the computer looking and doing stuff. I would meet with people, but I didn't like it was a lot of movement and very little reality like work. It was a lot of like, okay, let's meet. Maybe I'll invest. Maybe I'll join. Oh, this is interesting. Let's, you know, it wasn't like now. Now it's fun. It's like super, super it's focused, purpose. super purpose, super measurable. I don't have a spare second in, in the day. It's I love it. The reason why I brought this up is because often when I've spoken to individuals that have had good exits, they're very excited about the exit. They feel like they've accomplished something. They've got the financial gain that they were hoping for, or perhaps uh, even better. And here they are. They feel like they're on top of the world. And then weeks, if not months later, they start to realize that they just lost that drive that was so 
passionate that kept them going to build what they originally built. And now it's gone. They just don't have that direction, that purpose. And all of a sudden, they're just aimlessly going about their day and they need to find something pa- that they can get passionate about again. And so often I'm finding that after a number of months of, you know, at noon or two o'clock in the afternoon, still being in their pajamas, they're like, I've got to get, I've got to <laughs> figure this out. I, I'm, I'm better than this. And so you take these very, very successful people and uh, find that they just have to reinvent themselves and get back into the grindstone. That's what I, in essence, was hearing you say. It's amazing that you gave the pajamas story because, but I would say like 7 p.m., that's 2 p.m. Uh, and <laughs> I'm very fortunate to be married to an amazing, amazing woman that, uh, you know, she's a very good mirror to that. She would, you know, go off to do her thing and then say, okay, you know, like just do the dishes or just do something. And I would be on the computer with my pajamas. Then she'll come back and I would be still, you know, basically in the same position. Naturally, the dishes were not done. And so (laughs) for everyone that's married there, you know, you probably can assume that there was friction there, but it was a healthy friction that was okay. I need to, you know, move forward. Enough's enough. Yeah, the the thing that's funny to me is there's some people that will use the justification. I remember saying this when I was a teenager. Why make my bed? I'm just going to get back in it in 10 hours. Well, then you get to the the thought of, well, why get out of my pajamas? I'm just going to go to bed in 10 hours. So (laughs) you just stay in your pajamas. It's an evil cycle. So don't get don't get into that. I didn't even had enough consciousness uh, to to have that discussion internally at, at that stage. I was just, you know, like, Move. I had interesting things to do. I was like all around deals and stuff, but it was just, you know, it's it's shuffling stuff. It wasn't really good. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely glad you found your passion again, because I think living life with purpose is so much more fulfilling. So this is wonderful. All right. So here's where I want to go back. Um, I know that you've in relations to Anchor, uh, also started to have some interactions with Ron Baker and Hector Garcia. Uh, They're very much proponents of a subscription model, uh, something that John Warlow also uh, teaches. Uh, These are um, philosophies as it relates to billing relationships with our clientele. And when you deal with the subscription model, it does increase the valuation of your business because of the client relationship you have with the recurring billings. So uh, with that context, I just want to want to talk a little bit about why you want that route, how it relates to Anchor and any thoughts you have about subscription billing or recurring billing. Okay. So first of all, I think like uh, the credit goes to Ron Baker. I met him uh, and was fascinated by how modest he is, how, you know, pleasant he is to talk to, how open he is and how brilliant he was. So, and, you know, I'm new to the industry. I've been, you know, in this space for the past three and a half years. And he was always sort of the prophet. He's like, he's talking and, you know, he's sharing his vision for things. But what I noticed was, is that for a lot of people, there was a challenge taking the vision and implementing it into reality. And that was very exciting for me because I saw that Anchor could be a very, very good and easy vehicle to take the subscription model that, you know, that's his, you know, current book and his new philosophy into reality. And then so we we spoke about that. And then I said, okay, we need to find and work with the best implementer because, you know, I can be the gateway to technology. You have the amazing vision. We can build it together and and define it together. And then Hector uh, magically joined as the implementer. I think he's a very masterful implementer. He's, he understands everything very, very thoroughly, very creative. And he had the ability to take the vision using Anchor as a platform and then create a very, I think, sensible method to transition from one pricing model to the other. Because Ron is a very, you know, he's very, he's a straight shooter. He's like, okay, subscription is good. Stop doing what you're doing and shift. He has a few options, but little, but this is really what he he, he believes in. And Hector, you know, he has a practice. He says, okay, if I'll like do it like very drastically, I'll lose some clients. I don't, you know, I want it to be more moderated and something that will facilitate keeping most of the clients or all of them, making them feel good 
and being able to transition, you know, them slowly and gradually versus so basically like sort of the Adobe concept of, OK, I have a date from this date onwards, I'm shifting and slowly the rest of the people will follow. And, you know, I'm using technology to aid me. I'll, I'll go into some details about Anchor just so people have a concept. Basically, what we do, uh, we have a software a platform that includes proposals. It's digital. It's very, very different. It's not paper-based. It's a single source of truth that's dynamic and keeps on changing with the relationship. Once that's being signed, you know, the, the system asks for payment information up front, much like Amazon or any, you know, other SaaS or e-commerce concept. Then the invoices are generated automatically and it's being, you know, moved to the bank and reconciled. So having these components in place enable us to look at it and say, okay, so if we can actually go to clients and give them the option to subscribe to something and have them give them the ability to unsubscribe as well and show them there's, you know, different options and within each package facilitate the accountant so that they can actually migrate easily. So some of them, let's say, are doing hourly and they have an advanced like, you know, payment that they take up front and then down the line it changed to a fixed rate uh, that is valuable. So we're, we're catering to both hourly value-based fixed packages, add-on subscriptions. So we have everything supported in the system. So we're able to sort of build this puzzle that is able to create a smooth migration. And I would love to say that I'm the smart person that thought about it, but it's all Hector. So we've designed it with Hector around his needs for his own practice. And then, you know, and that was sort of, the objective was to build something that can cater you know, the entire community. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that that perspective because uh, having known Ron for a number of years, I've experienced his value pricing philosophy for, I dare say, almost a decade. So there's definitely a precedent there. And then recently he has started to be kind of the evangelist of this idea of subscription-based billing. The one thing that's powerful about that is John Warlow also wrote about it and he addressed it as the automatic customer. And it's this essential philosophy that in order to increase the valuation of a business, the more contractual you can have a relationship with your customer base, the more valuable that income or revenue is. And so the subscription model implies that there is this, this binding agreement that at least recurring money is happening. And so now you get Hector Garcia into the picture and he's able to actually help articulate what are the different pricing models that are traditionally in a, in a firm. And when I'm working with firms, the most common ones I experience are obviously the hourly situation, but you typically have flat rate, as you mentioned, you have menu pricing, you've got revenue-based pricing, you've got the uh, value-based pricing. Some may even refer to flat rate as being cost plus. But the point is, is in Anchor, you've got each of these identified so that you can have a very dynamic relationship with your clients. But what I think is perhaps most important is the fact that you're helping provide a means to move towards ultimately subscription-based pricing, hopefully based on a value-based pr uh, uh, price option. Is that a fair summary of what we're talking about here? I'm trying to be a lot more, uh, I think, gentle with being, you know, very decisive on what's right and what's wrong because I'm, I've seen, you know, I'm seeing so many businesses and I think it's all like the pricing concept that there's no right and wrong. It all is being should be dictated around your end goal. If you want to sell the company and you want to maximize the, you know, the amount of money that you're going to sell it, if you want a particular lifestyle or if you want to serve, you know, fewer customers, but give them a lot more attention because this is what's driving you. Or let's say you want to have a business that is very simple, but it's like McDonald's in a way that you want to provide like a simple service that you can outsource and automate most of it and then grow like X5 it. And so each pricing model will serve a different purpose. I think for the majority of, of uh, there's no majority. It's like a very, like, it's very, very personal to so some people, I think, you know, will love subscription because like my accountant, for instance, he would he didn't care about he didn't like calculate the hours he then billed me but what he cared about was making sure that i understand stuff i feel you know i feel well i can sleep at night and that 
he provides value and he provided exponential value to me. So I think for him, like, you know, if he's listening, uh, I assume he's not, but uh, I, I think <laughs> he he's, it would be wise for him to move to the subscription model because he's already plussing his offer. He's already super attentive. He already doesn't serve too many clients. So I think for him, that model fits his personality and his business objectives. For other people that, you know, not naturally, you know, like to, you know, go very, very deep into the clients or don't have that skill set. Because I think, you know, I've heard it like stop using the A word, like everybody are being sold, you know, the advisory concept, become an advisor. But some people right now, they're not at a stage where they're, you know, they can be an advisor that have enough rapport with their clients. If up until now you were taking X amount of dollars per hour and your own personal finances are okay, but they're not amazing. And it's very difficult to come to a client and say, okay, I will now be the doctor to your financial life. You need to have a specific skill set, and that's what Ron calls, you know, plus offering. But that comes with an evolution of your skill set, of your mindset. And it's not something that I say, okay, right now you're doing hourly, stop that, do subscription. I don't, I don't. I don't believe in that. And I think that it's very on a case by case scenario. And this is why we want to cater for everyone and give you the options to be able to easily navigate and even mix and match stuff uh, so that m moving forward, I think that more and more people will have access to subscription because it's not being treated as, you know, it's all or nothing kind of thing. There's no right and wrong, and because I think that is part of the reasoning that, you know, value pricing, which is phenomenal if you're looking at the actual monetary effect. But there's a few aspects to it that's prevented it from, you know, really catching fire uh, because it was complex to understand in terms of how you do it on one hand, and it ignored the personalities that we have in our community that we're less salesy and we're like, you know, we're more service people. And I think the subscription model enables our personality or caters to that a lot more than the value pricing model. So I think it has a lot, you know, a much higher chance to really, you know, take uh, a bigger majority of the community. Um, and I do feel that people that will adopt it will make more money. Uh, but again, yeah, I want to be, you know, I'm not judging anyone for their pricing model. And I see that, you know, there's these things sometimes happening. I don't do that. I think it's all around what is your goal? What do you want from your business and from your life? Well, I like how you started that by saying there's not a right or a wrong. Uh, one of the things that I think is important is even though I've listed off these five different uh, common pricing uh, models or systems, the uh, firms that I work with generally work with two. They pick of the selection two, and they make that be for their client base, the way they interact with their customers. And so I do believe you need to pick two that you become very um, confident in and able to you know, assess and, and uh, offer. So that I think was very important. But the other thing I want to uh, mention is there's a time and a place to actually make these changes. It's not something that you just learn about and then quickly implement. You do need to go through a implementation process. You need to onboard new clients with the new system, perhaps look at an evolution process for those that you're currently working with. So definitely a lot to be said there. Um, I do want to switch gears and end on one thing. Uh, I know you speak of revenue leakage. Uh, tell me what that is and how you uh, feel firms can avoid that so revenue leakage the way that it's you know the, the proper definition is basically money that was belongs to the company or was promised or was committed to the company uh but never ended up in your bank if we're putting it in in, in simple terms and i'll give mm -hmm. some examples so let's say you have an agreement with your client and you know you just met him it's a new client and you know you were willing to give him a 10 percent discount with the understanding that next year it's going to go to your normal rate or it's a normal rate and then goes up 10 percent next year what happens in most cases not most but some is that 
come December, uh, the lovely admin or, you know, the AR clerk or whoever deals with that just duplicates the December invoice and just continues that flow. No one goes back to the original agreement and says, oh, 10% up and, and go. If let's say, okay, there's a few cases, uh, I'm being deterministic, no one, but statistics is revenue leakage is something that uh, can burn out up to 4.6% from your bottom line. And these are businesses that, you know, don't have 90% margin. So that becomes very, very meaningful. Invoices, and I assume not the audience that are listening here, but some people have had an incident where they forgot to invoice something. None, none of the listeners here, naturally. But uh, that, you know, they spoke with a client, he asked something, and they said, oh, okay, okay, great. They wrote a post-it note or something, and by the end of the month, no one, you know, remember that? They recalled it three months later and said, ah, I didn't add it. And now what do you do? Do you waive it or do you go and collect it? A lot of people just say, ah, I'm an idiot. Now let's waive it. And these are the things you remember. And you know, most of the revenue leakage are things that you are completely unaware of. You forgot about them, you misplaced them, and they're leaking out of your business. Uh, and the way that we view it is this is money that automation can completely save. So the way we go about it is we have, because the proposal becomes an agreement and that agreement lives it's a living agreement. It's not like a paper concept where that governs the relationship. So if that agreement said 10% next year, automatically that would be added. And by doing that, we're changing two things. We're first of all, making sure it's not forgotten. But the other very important aspect is that we're removing the emotional human element out of you know the billing equation. Because a lot of us, let's say the client had a, a hard year. Although we're, you know, that's the agreement and you can pay it, but we're very emotional and say, oh, okay, okay, you know, I'm not, I don't want the friction in the conversation. I don't want the, we make up excuses and then we waive it or we simply forget it and we even don't do it. The f- minute that a computer does it and it's automated, it's like a Netflix. If Netflix sends you, okay, you know, you need to pay five more dollars, it's automated. You're not angry with Netflix. And I think that same situation where we're removing the human element out of, you know, the money aspect or the billing serves three purposes. One, massive efficiency. We're shaving off time, like, you know, really, really the impact that we're seeing is massive. The second is errors. And that causes both, you know, trust issues, money issues naturally, but more than anything, it makes your clients doubt your invoices. So that means not a, they trust you, but you're human. So everybody has a sad story about adding a zero to their ACH collection. And if, if it's a good story, it's two zeros. And what we've seen is that they need to validate. They're getting your invoice and they're your client needs to validate that, you know, it makes sense. If it's automated the way we're, you know, we're providing it so that the agreement actually generates the invoice automatically according to what was agreed, then they know for a fact there's no surprises. They don't need to validate. So it's canceling their AP process to you and it's canceling your AR process. Uh, So shaving off errors and building trust in in what you're doing and, you know, basically freeing headspace. Uh, The amount of time that, you know, it's hovering in your head, who needs to pay you, what do you need to collect? Like it's always somewhere there. So building and, you know, and collecting is not the end of the month because you're still chasing. And if we'll go into the Intuit statistics, when they purchased MailChimp, they went in to do a relatively vast survey of what were the biggest pain points for small businesses. And they discovered some sad realities. The first pain point is getting new clients. The second one was getting paid, which for us was mind blowing. And they saw that 60% out of businesses have uh, a large amount of invoices that are overdue by at least 60 days. And when we're looking at our clients, they're good people. They're not, if they're late, if there's late payments of any sort, if there's like issues, it's not because they're bad people. It's because we're sending them to work. We're sending them to validate. If Netflix would start and ask you to send them checks every month, I would assure you that the amount of 
you know, churn that they will have will be massive because, you know, I don't want to send a check. I want it to be, you know, like I don't want to deal with this. And that is the reality for SaaS, for e-commerce. But for service providers, all of a sudden, like it's a process. It needs to be valid. And, and we don't believe in that. I don't think, I think it's an inevitable future that this will be a thing of the past, that you don't need to chase, you know, validation and numbers and everything, everything needs to be connected. And it needs to be right now, the way that we figured out is that we had to build all these tools in one place that it's not siloed. So there's no difference of, you know, the numbers and discrepancies so that you can trust your own system. Uh, But moving forward with, you know, new banking and stuff like that, I feel that there's going to be a lot more openness to this. Uh, But at this stage, we had to build all the tools ourselves. Well, I love the example you gave of the revenue leakage because I do think a lot of people can relate to the idea of having done something, putting it on a post-it note or just trying to remember it. There's the anxiety, frustration of remembering it and forgetting. Therefore, you have this this missed opportunity and then writing it off, as you explained, just because it's been so long, you don't want to have to go back and try and explain what this additional fee is. So that's, I think, very real. I've experienced it myself. So I'm a big uh, a big proponent of automation, having processes. I like the fact that you're able to, in your um, explanation there, see ways to automate this process. And clearly, Anchor is, is trying to simplify that and, and uh, automate it as well. So uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. I feel that we've really hit on a number of things, insightful intrigues as to not only your perspectives as it relates to business from being outside of the accounting profession, but also these insights that you have as to how we can improve what it is we're doing in the accounting profession. So thank you for all that. Here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to give some final thoughts here, and then I'm going to come back to you for a closing thought. Uh, Real quickly, I do want to point out as an offer, you can go to the episode description, and as our listeners, you can actually take advantage of a discount link that they're providing for Anchor. It's something I would encourage you to check out with this. You can get a good demo and understand a little bit more of what it is Anchor can do to automate your processes to not only just get the engagements and really have clear engagements with your clients, but simplify the process of getting paid for that work. And I really think it's quite insightful to see what they've created and how it can actually simplify the friction that exists between you and your client as you're servicing them. The second thing is, is that they actually offer an express service, kind of the white glove onboarding experience that you want to check out. This is something that I would encourage you to look at as it's basically designed to make the implementation of Anchor within your firm something that's seamless and easy. So definitely check out both of these things that are available to you as listeners of the podcast. As a summary of today's conversation, one of the things that I was excited to discuss with Omri at the very beginning was the transition from having sold some successful business startups, getting into that phase of kind of consultancy and then finding this passion again within the accounting space, providing this anchor service. Uh, I knew of that story and I thought it was something that would be worth listening to simply because I believe as we work with our accounting clients, they're going to experience much of what Omri uh, shared. It's that whole idea of I've got something, I'm doing something, I'm great at it, then what? And I think we miss as a opportunity, the opportunity to work with our clients in the next venture and the next thing that they're doing. And so holding on to them as accounting clients and staying in touch with them, even after they've sold, I dare say that with their passion and and, uh, uh, enthusiasm for business, most of these individuals that have sold will come back within, say, six months, 12 months, 18 months into the business community again with some new venture. And it's something to be uh, at least – you know, keep your your finger on the pulse type thing with those clients. The other thing that I thought was very uh, important is basically Omri's explanation of business as it relates to subscription models. Uh, It's kind of the talk of the time right now. People are discussing recurring billings and to hear his perspectives perspectives as it related to Ron Baker, Hector Garcia, I think those insights were something that uh, we can all benefit from. So I'm grateful for his sharing that. And then this last thing of revenue leakage, very true very appropriate. Not only do we experience it, but we see it with our clients. It's that much more important that we go ahead and offer our services in that space. And then lastly, you touched on it. We didn't go too deep into it. And it's this idea of being able to offer advisory services. I do feel that that's an additional skill set that as accounting professionals, we need to pursue and consider. So here's what I'd like to do. Uh, Amri, what is a closing thought that you'd like to end with? I would, you know, ask the listeners, to go back and really ask yourself 
what it is that you want to achieve. I think we're all in this fast paced moving thing that a lot of us have forgotten why we, you know, even got into the business. And then we're sort of chasing something that we not always know what it is. So take some time, ask, where do you want to, you know, reach? What, what's, what is success for you? And I think that asking that question, you know, and looking at it with, you know, very, being very honest with yourself will, will answer a lot of the questions that arise, you know, when you're inside the trenches of what I, what should I do? What pricing model should I grow? And, you know, or should I actually limit and fire clients, which is another topic like these days. So I think, you know, going back to the basics and really, really trying to understand what it is that you want. And, and that's hard. That's not always easy because uh, a lot of times we're chasing something that is not necessarily even our own desires, like something we got out of someone else. So I think that's understanding that is critical. And that's what I'm trying to do every day and make sure that I'm focused. So that's my, you know, that's my advice to, to others. Very good. Well, Omri, thank you for that. Uh, real quickly, as we're wrapping things up, I do want to actually mention a few quick things for the listeners. First of all, again, go to the episode description for that information regarding Anchor to take advantage of that discount and that onboarding experience that they're providing. I'd also like to mention that there are some additional resources available at universalaccounting.com. It's there at universalaccounting.com. You can find a variety of free things such as ebooks, courses and such that are available to assist you as you're working on your business to build the premier accounting bookkeeping tax business. We also want to invite you to join us for GrowCon. GrowCon is an annual event. It's where we have the owners of bookkeeping accounting tax businesses come to hear from the experts off the stage. And as they're speaking to us from the stage, we want them to actually give us the insights of things that we can be doing to improve the marketing and selling, the growth of our businesses, the services that we're providing to our clients, and the efficiency in which we're doing the work. So come join us for GrowCon. If you haven't already registered, definitely do so. And we look forward to seeing you there. Also, with regards to this, I do want to point out that if you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, definitely do so. Each and every week, we come out with new episodes, exciting discussions that you can actually hear from the experts. I also, with regards to the subscription, encourage you to go back and binge listen to our episodes. On the website, universalaccounting.com, you can find highlights that we've put together, basically topical things that you can look at that relate to your situation as it is right now. Binge listen episodes that relate to marketing, selling, onboarding, pricing, mental health, and so, so much more. All that being the case, always remember this. If you'd like more information about these principles or these services, you can always reach out to us directly at Universal Accounting. Just give us a phone call at 801-265-3777. Or you can also visit us online at universalaccountingschool.com. And remember this, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care and have a great day and be safe out there.